a hit. I'll be honest, I, I played a very high standard. Yeah, a superstar. Give some lessons. Determination. Was extremely, extremely Welcome to the Chess Underground. Eccentricities, peculiarities, and theoretical novelties. And I felt be down in flames my style. I felt my style skills. I only do so. From a distance. We gather here today to uh, celebrate this thing called life. Uh, no, this is not a Prince song. Uh, we gather here today to talk about uh, what is chess most like? Gopal, what is chess most like? Out of all things, right? Could be anything. Sport, game. Uh, that's, wow. That's a, what a great question. Um, I mean, I, I hit him with I the guess, bangers. We're not starting off, you know. It, yeah. yeah, coming out with the, the fire, as the right. children are saying. <laughs> uh, I mean, honestly, it's like everything, but very different also. You know, like one of the things I know we've talked about in our own conversations are just the, just that, like, what's, what's that hacky phrase? Like, bro, it's just, it's just like chess or, you know, you know, chess, oh man, it's just like life, like, shut up like or, or i mean yes but no i'm playing they're playing checkers but i'm playing chess oh yeah that's probably the worst one <laughs> like can you imagine like living your life and like how like that that means something to you i i always take issue with that just because i mean i i don't even understand the comparison you know they're i get where i get what they're going for but it just it kind of falls flat for me right i mean I mean, I understand the the draw rate is higher. I mean, in uh, drafts, I believe <laughs> is what they they refer to it now. Like, or at least that's the international version of American checkers. Like, based on like whatever brief research I've I've done, you right. know. Like, I ju I just don't know what it means. Yeah, uh, we sound like I, two very sen like like. Then I expect the next thing I'm going to say is like, get off my lawn. You know. Oh, oh, for sure. I mean. <laughs> Yeah, this will be a, diff a, a different topic, like when we roast, uh, you know, chess Twitter, basically. Like, right, chess Twitter definitely roasting. Be. Yes, exactly. That's, a, that's like, a good idea for a segment, chess Twitter roasting. Oh, for sure. Um, like, uh, there's a funny story I, I have. So, like, um, if, like, for those of you who know me, like, they know I'm a <clears throat> competitive pool player. Like, I play in tournaments, leagues, um, stuff like that. And so there is a pool game called One Pocket where uh, basically like a certain corner pocket behind the rack area where the balls are, are racked or set up uh, at the start of the game. Um, each player has their own designated pocket. And like the goal is to make like eight balls out of the 15 in, you know, your designated pocket. And so, you know, it's, it's not always the case when the balls are, are broken, that they're wide open. You know, it's a lot of moving stuff around, like a lot of strategy and a lot of patience. And so people often refer to that as the chess of pool, which it's like, yes and no. Uh, just because like a lot of the game, you know, for most of the time, it's very kind of stable or static. Um, but there is one commentator who's a really good friend of, uh, my coach, uh, Larry Schwartz, who has helped me a lot with pool, but uh, this friend of his, his name is Billy in Cardona. Uh, he's known as like the voice of pool, like a very popular commentator. But billion, like 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 a billion dollars. Uh, Billy, yes, Billy William in Cardona, exactly. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And so he has often likened like this situation <laughs> where a a player is just trying to get out of their inning, you know, without much, like not really improving their situation, but also not really making it worse. 
So yeah. he al- has always likened that to, you know, it's, it's similar to when you're playing chess. You don't know what to do. You move a pawn, which to me is like that's the worst thing, you know, you could do. And I right. actually got a chance to tell him that in person. And then he tried to explain to me, well, you know, it's just like, uh, like he basically told me the same thing. I'm like, okay, well, I mean, if I wanted to hear an echo, I would log <laughs> into this clean feed recording without you on it. Like, It's interesting because I just used the baseball analogy yesterday, like literally last night with a student. You were talking mm-hmm. about getting out of an inning, right? Like just minimizing right. the damage. Yeah. And we were talking about sort of the same thing, like when you've, when you're not sure what to do, or even if you've made like a tiny mistake, like don't make it worse. Right. And it's interesting the type of move example I gave in the position. If you can picture it, it's like a Botvinnik English, uh-huh. where like the Black King is on G8 and there's pawns on H6 and G6, but the F pawn is gone; it's been traded, and you have your Bishop Fianchetto on G7, and the <clears throat> there's a lot of tension in the center. And there's a, there's a tendency, I think, for lower-rated players to just, like, want to start trading things and making captures, right? Right, to seek clarity. Right. But the move I suggested, I was just like, what about either King H8 or King H7? Because right. both of them have, like, a purpose, right? Like, King H7 defends your H and G pawns. And King H8 gets away from the light square bishop check, you know, bishop D5 check and king on G8. Yeah, you could regroup maybe knight g8 or something like that, too. Yeah, actually, that was a point, because the knight is on e7. You can go knight g8, knight f6. and Right, that's... so it's black with the botvinnik setup. Not, right, not right, right. Yeah, yeah, gotcha. <clears throat> and so you can kind of, you know, from that from that scenario, that, to me, that is like getting out of the inning, right? Like, that yeah. is like getting to the next phase. Right, yeah, but like definitely you know, what you don't want to do is make your position worse. And like every sort of pawn move without a purpose, like does weaken your position, even if it's not uh, felt or like immediately by the opponent. Like for instance, uh, as you know, as you know, I've, I've been a sort of on and off fan. uh, Well, it's sort of like a, a secret passion of mine, maybe a bad habit even of playing the modern Benoni is black. Sure. And so in a lot of lines, like you have a choice of whether to insert a six, you know, to threaten B five, utilizing your queen side majority and almost like at least what 96% of the time, white's probably going to play a four to restrain it. And, you know, I would say when I was probably like a 22 or even low 2300, I really didn't understand the difference or the harm because like, you know, I wasn't playing lines with knight a6 or b6, bishop a6, utilizing the free a6 square. So I thought, eh, whatever, you know, I'll just, you know, take off in the b5 inclusion. square. Yeah. Right, yeah, but it actually hurts black um, in a lot of ways. Like Petrosian, for example, was famous for this idea of rook a3, um, which is sort of a offensive uh, move, like if black's king side is compromised or a defensive move, you know, it can really be powerful on the third rank. So like, that's like, that just grants white an option that, you know, they didn't really need to have. Whereas like spending a tempo on a four and work a three unprovoked would give black time to do something more constructive. And so as I got to higher and higher levels in chess uh, and like the understanding, that's like something I I realized, you know, but it took, it took me a while. So it, I just, oh, that's why I always kind of laughed at, at the idea of just moving a pawn, you know, for the sake of it. Right. Which you, you realize very quickly as you progress up the levels in chess is, as you said, literally one of the worst things to do. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and talking about static positions like this, like they're not really well covered in chess literature. Um, like I'll say probably the best I've seen uh, on this topic done is Cotronius's book, uh, How to Play Equal Positions. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I don't know if we've ever talked about that or if you've seen it, but it was published by uh, one of our favorite publishing houses, uh, Chess Stars. Okay. Yeah, they got they have great books. But, um, but yeah, like I, I was intrigued because, number one, Cotronius kind of taking a break from writing an opening book, you know, so that was, that was pretty interesting. And, yeah, one of the, the things he advocates... Um, is like the challenging of the conventional wisdom, like a, a bad plan 
is better than no plan at all. Yeah. And, you know, he kind of just goes into this big thing about like how modern chess is, is just very concrete and kind of on a move by move basis. So like he, in his sort of move by move approach that he advocates throughout the book, uh, you know, one of your goals is to not make the position worse if you cannot like really strengthen it or break the balance in some way, you know? Right, right. That's interesting because, okay, so we were sort of leaning into, I mean, maybe that's not the right word. We were dipping our toe into mm-hmm. the sports department, right? With like, right, yes. I would consider billiards uh, or pool. I would consider that a sport. And we mm-hmm. talked about baseball innings. Chess, yeah. chess, um, as a, as a concept or as an analogy, it's sort of, it used to be present in popular culture. Like you could see it here and there. You would see a chessboard in, in a movie in the background, or it might be mentioned in passing. I would say it's trending now towards like almost omnipresent in like culture and pop culture references. Mm-hmm. And it, one one place where it is is definitely like sports and athletics. You know, we oh, I thought term. you were going to say DJ Khaled's uh, <laughs> lyrics. But oh no, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, anyway, yeah. so sorry. Uh, so present in like sports analogies. And I, I think like what I would like to see is I would like to see at the beginning of every like serious chess match, you just do DJ Khaled. Like, wouldn't that be great? Right before, maybe like right after they make the first move and press the clock. Oh, maybe. I mean, I'll. I'll let that be your in, your entrance song. <laughs> no, thank you. All right. Anyway, so but we were like kind of like dipping our toe into sports, right? And w- so I have I have a thought that I want to get to on this, but let's start here, which is you know, is chess like any particular sport, or are sports like chess, or are we just kind of like cherry picking somewhere in the middle? And the reason I think of this is because of your comment you were just making about playing equal positions, right? Yeah. Like, that's an interesting topic, which seems almost like not necessarily unique to chess, but certainly like more common in chess than other games and sports, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I mean, because, okay, like, uh, I I guess like with certain sports, like even most uh, pool games, like, like, and also kind of similar like chess, like they, they just have more of a dynamic element. Mm-hmm. You know, or at least maybe that's my superficial understanding. Like, I'm not as well versed in sports as you or uh, enemy of the podcast, uh, William Aramil. <laughs> just kidding. He's actually a friend, but I just I hate saying friend of the podcast. Enemy of, enemy of the podcast is good. That yeah. has like some undertones, maybe, and, and interesting uh, vibes. I, I dig no. it. Okay. No, we lo- we love him. But yeah, that, that's JJ Lang's term. I'm not out here to steal anybody's terminology. But yeah, anyway, so sorry, let's get back to that. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not really so well versed in, in sports. Like, can you, uh, could you, so like, like a good elaborate? example would be, um, let, let's say, uh, well, let's go back to the, the innings one, right? Cause that's one where we're both sort of in the same location. Like to me, that's an element of, of a sport. Like, okay, I'm in a jam. I got to get out of this jam and get on to the next inning that we can relate to a moment in chess, right? It's mm-hmm. an element of a sport. It's a specific um, thing or like aspect of it that we can relate to a chess concept. But I think a lot of analogies and like similarities start to break down when you try to move them to like a larger scale. Does that make sense? Yeah, for sure. Like one of the ones that I hate the most is, and I'm a huge NFL fan. I love watching football. Um, oh, it's a real chess match out there. Yes. That drives me. Oh nuts. God. It's <laughs> awful. <laughs> that drives me uh-huh. absolutely nuts. It's like, I it's know. not at all. Like, no, 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 no. Um, and I think it's, you know, it's almost just like, uh, it's become this popular term uh, or phrase yeah. that's almost like a crutch, you know, when it's like, it, what what are you really trying to say when you're saying that? Like, if you really break it down, what is the announcer actually trying to say? I mean, it, I think it's kind of like, okay, the character of play is uh, like, it slows down a bit. Um you know, just just more delicate and nuanced. Uh, I mean, it's not like the guy's rushing towards like making this great touchdown or something out of nowhere. You know, where it's very right. dynamic and and people are trying to stop him. You know, like like action and counteraction. I guess maybe is like the is that more or less like the basis of the analogy, right? Like, oh, that's, is that why it's dynamism? a chess match? Yeah, because like you know we're looking at doing something and you're trying to counter that, so we're going to change it up slightly and. I, 
I don't know. It, it just feels very almost like vague, if that makes sense. I mean, yeah, I can't speak like to football, but it seems like, uh, you know, especially like, okay, pool's probably the best or like any Q sport really like I'm, I'm like better versed in, you know, than, than just regular sports. But, uh, yeah, like, like usually when they say that it, it means just something more delicate, like, like action or counteraction, or maybe like lack of dynamics, Lack of explosiveness. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so the game is like more boring and we're just thinking about what we're going to do. And that's why it's more like chess. Right. That, but are they, are they stereotyping us? Do we need to file? A that, class well, that's, lawsuit? well, that's true. But I mean, you know, the irony is that the, the people that say that, like, of course, don't really understand, uh, chess, you know, on a, on a high level. So it's, and how like, tension is created in those moments. Well, yeah. And like, let's say, for example, like I, I was watching a, a situation yesterday where like two of the best players in the world, uh, Francisco Bustamante and Efren Reyes, um, you know, two of the best players of all time uh, in pool, were playing one pocket and they both had seven balls apiece. So they're just battling to position this one ball in like some advantageous way where the other guy can't re-safe it or you know, maybe like bang, have some crazy shot towards their pocket, but like each shot, it looks like nothing's really happening. They're, they're punting around, but something is happening. There are like certain like nuances and and a millimeter off either direction could be like really almost fatal. And a lot of times in chess too, when people talk about boring or not in games between strong players, like there are a lot of subtleties they're right. just hidden kind of in the background and they're kind of invisible to most people. Right. And if, and I, I've always found that like in those moments, those very tense, like equalish moments, those can be, you know, if you, if you have an understanding of what's going on and, and sort of the why behind the moves, those right. can actually be some of the most like entertaining to follow along with. Oh, oh, definitely. Yeah. Because the, the tension does build and right. inevitably when it reaches the boiling point, like, like, you know, this from chess, uh, that one of the hardest things to do psychologically is to switch gears. Like, let's yeah. say, you know, you're building, you've, you've amassed like quite a bit of force, uh, to attack, for example. And then, you know, now, now you have to pull the trigger and launch this like very violent assault. And okay. If we look at the opposite, like even harder probably is like, let's say you have this massive attack or you're playing super actively and you're, and it probably leads to, let's say a win in material or something like that, like a pawn, you know, your opponent can exchange off some pieces at some cost, but you have to switch gears now to technical, more slower, more slow, uh, consolidating way of play. Uh, to me, that's probably psychologically more difficult than switching gears the other way, but either way, it is a very difficult thing to do to switch gears like that. I think you're right. And look, here's another, here's another area where we can isolate like a single element about chess and we can say like, okay, it's kind of like this where, right. If we think about sports, there's momentum within a match, right. You know, like you can almost sometimes sense if you're watching, uh, let's say a live soccer match, um, where, when one team begins pressing a little more, right. Right. Where maybe there's like a little more momentum headed that direction. I I don't know. I, I think again, it feels a little bit like cherry picking to me. Like, yeah, it's like that in that way but yeah mm. although soccer is an interesting one for me i I have a background in soccer because space is a big thing like space and spacing and as we know like there okay so there's something that's kind of synonymous with chess um and also we were just talking about playing equal positions right i think that's a sport where two very evenly matched teams sort of approach equal positions or equal games of course in soccer Similarly mm-hmm. to how you might a- approach a chess game, right? Because yeah. it's maneuvering and it's like trying to, to probe for weaknesses. And, and sometimes even we can think in chess, right? Like, like pro- <clears throat> trying to get the other, the other player to commit to a weakness somewhere, right? Mm-hmm. Either with a substitution or putting, a, putting some speed on the outside or what have you. So again, yeah. I think you can like cherry pick these little tiny things, but like maybe here and there it's, it's just not quite adding up. I don't know. Well, it, uh, you know, this actually, your comment kind of reminds me of uh, an analogy I saw. I can't remember who, what grandmaster said it, but 
uh, Jakob Argard, when he was writing his uh, first books, like they were for every Manchester. So I think he was probably still an I am back then. Yeah. Um, there was something I believe in excelling at technical chess, which is a book I read a lot. Um, you know, probably like 2014, 13, something like that. And uh, yeah, he talks about, uh, or there's one quote by this grandmaster in conversation with him that said something like, uh, you know, sometimes chess is like soccer, you know, you score a point or, or something, and then nothing interesting happens the rest of the game. So it's like, you know, sometimes you win a pawn, <laughs> That's a good one. Right? I like that. and then yeah. nothing interesting happens. Like, and the game just you can ends, see this. Yeah. Right, yeah, you could definitely see this uh, with Capablanca, you know, where he looks right. like he's not really doing anything special, but that's the sort of the placid beauty in his play, like, so Oh, I like that, placid beauty. Not. Yeah, for sure. Okay, so I was brainstorming this topic. What is, what is chess most like, or what is most like chess? And there, there, I, I made like a big list, but there were two that really stuck out to me that I was like, I gotta, I gotta try this out on GoPal. So are you ready for mm-hmm. number one? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. Drum roll, please. Okay. Chess is most like stand up comedy. Ooh. Uh, wow. That's a, oh, that's a good one. Uh, so yeah, I, I think some of the, I don't know if all the listeners know this, but I, yeah, I would briefly did stand up comedy and I still, I still write stuff every now and then, you know, haven't really done it since uh, COVID started, but. So I'll, yeah. I'll, let me make the case since you're, since you Go have ahead. sort of experience doing it and I don't. Um, yeah. And, and here are some of the things that I thought of, and then I want to sort of hear your reaction and, and your thoughts on it. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, so why is just like stand up comedy? Okay. First of all, preparation, as you just yeah. pointed out to, uh, to, or alluded to you, um, yeah. You write jokes, right? You write some material. Um, and, and it's not just book preparation. It's not just written preparation. I'm sure you also like practice it, right? Like delivery. Right. And you need, you need some, you need to be able to work on your preparation, you know, sort of and, and mm-hmm. test it out just like chess, right? I mean, we have our book yeah. preparation, we have our research, we have our writing. Reading, phase. Yeah. Reading a crowd and like having some back, like in calculation too, you'll have backup lines. Like if things are not going well, so like Ooh. if you can't read yeah. a, <clears throat> you know, if you haven't read a crowd correctly and like you can already sense the trend of that, uh, of your set going wrong, you, you can, you know, there are ways to recover certain jokes or something like that. Uh, Right. Definitely. Actually, so that was that's very similar to another point that I had about stand up comedy, which was like, you know, um, even with a plan and preparation, things could go off the rails, you know, <laughs> and you might have to yeah. just be very impromptu, just like in a chess game. Right. At some point, more than likely, you're going to get to an impromptu moment and how you react and and mm-hmm. the things that you do are going to be very important. Right. Um, so, OK. Yeah. So what do you think? What do you think of this one? Is there is there does it have legs? Uh, yeah, a little bit. I mean, it, it, I, I still stick by my answer. Like that chess is very similar to a lot of things, but just also quite different. Like certainly, uh, skills like it, like, sure. It, it does have a little bit of legs, but definitely the skills that you are required to have in order to be like a strong chess player are present in a lot of things like in stand up comedy and also, that's one thing I, I had to say, like circling back to pool, um, like chess players, you know, we're not known to be the, the, the best coordinated people. <laughs> Let's just say like, I mean, yeah, like my hand-eye coordination is not really that good. So I had to work very hard and like to get at some sort of decent, like amateur level and then, uh, be able to diagnose certain mistakes, uh, Like if, if, you know, no, like just really thinking about it, noticing tendencies, like just always paying attention to something and keeping an open mind, which is something that, uh, anybody trying to improve in chess has to do. Well, Hey, you know, you're helping me, you're helping me further this stand up comedy analogy, right? Because post-mortems, of course we do those in Uh, chess and kind of review. And I'm sure you, you do the same thing after a live set, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, for sure. Like definitely the people who are more serious uh, about it are, um, you know, like I kind of, I kind of see it as like a opening repertoire. Um, mm-hmm. The way some of the, these like serious stand up comics uh, present themselves. Like I've seen uh, from maybe like 
the time I started going to open mics before I was sort of flirting with the idea of doing it. Um, and then actually doing it a couple of times. Like I've seen certain comedians who would always come to these open mic nights and uh, week after week, they would grind the same routine over and over again. Maybe you'd be the exact same. Uh, maybe you'd be just a slight tweak, but um, you know, that requires a lot of discipline. And so when it comes back to opening repertoires, like probably I'd say one of my faults as a player is just like switching it up too often. Uh, not did just you do the like, same in your, were you a grinder? Or did you do the same in your, your comedy appearances? Oh no, I, I knew I wasn't in it for uh, a long time. I was in it for a good time, you know? Uh, <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. But yeah, like, no, I would come with a new routine every time, but I mean, also to be fair, I, I made sure to choose my crowd. Uh, I would always try to go on earlier, you know, when it's people like on dates or happy hour remnants, like, uh, but because like, if you stick around till like, let's say one, two in the morning, it's mostly crusty comics just waiting <laughs> that have been waiting all, all like the whole time. And crusty that's, comics. Oh it's really God. a tough audience, uh, unless, you know, you see somebody like Hannibal Burris make an appearance or something right. like that, which understandably so he's great. So, so yeah, I mean, I think that this is an interesting one for a lot of reasons because they're so, if you think about it on, on just a very surface level, they're just two entirely different disciplines. Yeah. Um, but then when you start to break it down, I mean, even, even something like you were just talking about, like, like, uh, like knowing your opponent, knowing your audience, right. Like knowing their yeah. tendencies and, um, or even you could say like, this is a very broad one, but just, I'm going to just say the word psychology, right. Yeah. And that plays such a, a large factor in both endeavors, um, mm -hmm. between, you know, like stand up comedy and chess, I, I think. I don't know. I thought I wanted to ask you about that because I know you you've you've done both. And it was one that I thought might be surprising to an extent. But also, if you kind of really look at it, maybe chess is like stand up comedy. I don't know. Yeah, the more yeah, the more you talk about it, like, uh, yeah, definitely, for sure. Um, I mean, it, it depends like also to the like different approaches, like certain comedians would be very principal, like they will know the profile or demographic of their audience and still kind of still basically be themselves unapologetically, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, if you're, yeah. I, yeah. So sort like of like a, won't. sort of like a Vashiel Lagrave who just plays the same repertoire no matter what. Right. Exactly. You're but, getting you know, an idor, you, if you're getting a Grunfeld, have fun. Good luck. Yeah, exactly. Oh, well, may, yeah, maybe not so much lately, but for sure. A few years right, ago. For yeah, a while. Yeah. Like that. yeah. Right. That's okay. Great, I got another one way here. to put it. I got another one here. Are you ready? Mm -hmm. This should be interesting. <laughs> what is chess most like? How about relationships? Romantic oh relationships. Oh uh, well, <laughs> I don't know if... Uh, uh, why are you asking a chess player about this? We, we're fair not, point. You know, okay, fair no, point. Just <laughs> point, go, Paul. Yeah. Uh, okay, here. Uh, state your case. I kind of don't want to on this one. <laughs> Well, okay, neither I'll, do I. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so all right, let's let's start. Oh, let's no. well, let's start with a few obvious ones. Okay, um, same same with uh, same with stand up comedy. Let's let's begin with preparation, right? Well, um, I'll, I'll I'll say this with regards to preparation. Sorry to cut you off, but like, uh, <laughs> do I like rehearse the interactions I know I'll have throughout the day in front of a mirror? No, of course Before I not. Step out of the house? No, no. Why would I do that? <laughs> but why would I? Why would I like think of a you know a good comeback in the shower like well, two what days I, after? What, what I mean by happened. that is like let's say like um, before a first date, like you want to get to know the person, uh -oh. right? Or um, you want to like have conversations with them and see if you're compatible, right? I, I mean, look, you as am I. One of our guilty pleasures is the show Love Is Blind, right? Yes. <laughs> so like i mean i don't want our audience to like picture us like curled up under a blanket with like a tub of ice cream and and popcorn uh watching love is blind even though that may be true in my case uh but um you or know, holding hands with with my uh cousin <laughs> like me and him we always do that after going to the gym for some reason i don't know why that's just wait you hold you come back you hold hands and watch 
Love is Blind. Well, yeah, with with him, we watched a lot of cringe TV. Um, <laughs> so lately, it was Love is Blind. You know, we we pause it to like look at like some awkward faces or like rewind it to hear some like weird voices or when somebody mispronounces something at it. And then of course, like we yell at the screen, uh, you know, when something like upsets us, like probably comes a bit too close to some of the trauma that we've experienced in our lives, <laughs> you know, just, it's, pr- it's like pretty normal, like normal stuff, right. Normal yeah. post gym stuff. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Gotcha. Okay. Anyway, so, sorry. No, but if you're familiar with the con- for, for for listeners who aren't familiar with the concept of the show, um, people go into these pods. They cannot see the, the person that they're quote unquote dating or like trying to date, and they just have long conversations where they're learning about the other person. Right now, that's sort of an extreme example of preparation before like dating someone or being in a relationship with someone. But even you know, like let's just say you know maybe you're a Tinder user or something. Right, you're like looking at their profile. You're reading a little bit about them. You're looking at their photos. Right, there's some preparation that goes into it. Maybe not as much as in a chess game, but there's some. Mm-hmm. Um, here's another big one that I had in terms of making the case, uh, you know, chess, if you put a lot of time and effort into it can be very rewarding and it yeah. can also be extremely frustrating despite the time and effort you put into it. Yes. Okay. So I don't think I need to explain that analogy any further in terms of relationships. Wait, I don't um, get it. No, I'm just kidding. Go ahead. <laughs> so, I mean that, you know, there's another one. Um, also, you know, again, similar to stand up, there are like read and react moments, right. Where you have to sort of. Uh, adjust and adapt. Um, Another thing that I thought of in terms of this one in particular was um, I think of like late career, like toward like right at the very end career Kromnik, where he sort of reinvented himself as an attacking player. Right. Yeah. And this E4 player and doing all sorts of stuff. So like the idea of sometimes going through necessary, like self-evaluation and like reinvention, um, I think is another important one. Um, also, you know, in chess, one of the most critical skills, if you really want to improve is being able to sort of, um, self-assess and evaluate, like, you know, what you need to work on and, and understand like what your strengths and weaknesses are again, big Mm -hmm. correlation with relationships there. So I don't know. What do you think? Am I onto something? Am I, am I full of it? Should we go, Uh, should we go get in a pod and have long conversations into the deep hours of the night with our notebooks? Yeah, I, yeah yeah definitely for sure i mean i'll say this juggling the two is never easy um like chess and relationships for sure no matter how uh similar they are you know uh definitely like the the preparation aspect though i I love that like working uh kind of on your like on yourself and like you know just and and really being honest in in diagnosing with you you or you know, your Your life coach, therapist. Yeah. Your life coach, (laughs) your feelings journal on your bedside table next to your opening preparation. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Shout out to JJ. Yeah. Shout out to JJ amateurs, amateur feelings haver and chess teacher. Is that right? Professional chess teacher and amateur feelings haver, something like that. And we should mention his co-host, Julia, uh, professional, Therapist? I forgot what she is, but yeah. I forgot something. Yeah, know, she, an yeah, amateur Julia's, checkmate. Julia is awesome. Yeah, yeah that's okay. it. Right. Yeah. So, <laughs> but yeah, but like honestly, um, I think like there's like this one. There's some connections here. You know, if you if you really look into it, and if you think about, you know, um, like both of them require like significant time commitments and like dedication. If you if you want to if you want to be strong at either one, um, right? I don't know. What do you think? Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, okay. Ding. Uh, this yeah. is where I need, I need the sound effect. I need to be able to like press a button and have like, you know, the, the check mark or the green check mark. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, I just like, I mean, I don't feel uncomfortable answering this question, but like, I just don't know. But you kind of do. Uh, yeah, maybe a little bit, but uh, not, no, just not really. I just, I'm not really sure what else uh, to add. I mean, I think it kind of just speaks for itself. I mean, maybe some of the chess players in the audience. Uh, one one time, know a long time about ago, relationships, but yeah. <laughs> in, when I was in college, I was interviewed for our school newspaper, mm-hmm. and I was asked the question. Uh, they were interviewing me specifically about chess, but I, I had won the Iowa championship that year, and they asked me a question. They said, "You know, has being a good chess player ever gotten you a date?" 
So I'm now going to pass that question on to you. Wow, that's a fantastic question. Um, <laughs> s- let me think. Since we're kind of like ra- ragging on chess players and their dating lives, right? I, we should, I would we say should be truthful. Yes, I would say yes. I'm sure it has. Like, and I would say it has probably helped my case more than like it, it hurt it. Like, I, I remember only one person probably like. It was like you, like just just you, yeah, exactly. That that, but that's like really such a a small like, yeah. In, in terms of you know the people that were because like who who else knows you know another professional chess player like maybe you know one right right. Uh, but like, but yeah, I don't think it it is really. I think I think it's mostly help. So yes, I'll I'll go with a yes on that one. What about you? Explain also- in more detail than I ever could. <laughs> I also answered yes, actually. Okay. Um, and as I recall, uh, there was a specific incident in my mind. Um, mm-hmm. When I answered that question, yes, I was at a party. Uh, I don't remember if it was like a house party or a dorm party, but some kind of party. And my friend and roommate, uh, Olu Femi Oyekan, shout out to Femi. Uh, we were playing a blindfold game against each other at the party, like, uh, I don't know why we decided to do this. You know, we had had, you know, maybe a, an adult beverage or two. And we just started like saying moves out loud and playing each other a blindfold game. And uh, I ended up getting a, a date. I ended up getting a, a, a girlfriend out of it. Uh, we dated for like a couple months because um, she thought it was cool that I knew how to play chess so well that I could play it without a board. And I taught mm-hmm. her how to play a little bit too. So the answer to that question was for me anyway, yes. And I think like, Probably for most people, especially now that chess has become like cool after, you know, during the pandemic and with the streamers and Queen's Gambit and everything. Like, yeah, I think probably most people would be able to answer that question. Yes. If, you know, the circumstances were such that it, that it factored into their life somehow. Oh, for sure. Of either gender for that matter, of either sex. Oh, a hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. Like, uh, yeah, definitely the, the visibility helps and, yeah, I'm sure, whatever, I'll continue to keep milking that proverbial cow, you know, for a while. But <laughs> The visibility uh, helps, but we still hate all the stupid analogies. Here, you know, you know what my, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, what no, go, go for it. I just said visibility helps, but we still hate all the stupid analogies people make about just. Oh, oh, 100%. Yeah. Terrible. You were going to say um, that. Yeah, like, I, I think my biggest issue, though, is like, the smoothness uh, of how I can maybe sort of uh sort of use that in my favor like like because especially you know with online dating and the apps and stuff it's just like uh whatever you know just ra- would rather have a conversation in person so like what do you say like maybe you know i could show you some moves sometime or something like that's a very <laughs> cringy one that i've, I've yeah. used like extreme cringe oh my i'd have to look i I'd have to look at some screenshots. Like, did you to, ever just like begin uh, like a tender conversation with like one dot e four? You know, I want to say that I, I have, but I'm not. Um, Are you tempted to do positive. that if you see like chess as one of their interests, like in their profile or whatever? Yeah, or like you know, I would ask like you know, what are your uh, feelings on the cos uh, the causal variation of the Richter Rouser or something, you know, but that's, but like, see that one has disadvantage. It like comes off a little pretentious. Right. Maybe. Like, I mean, whatever. I'll find, I'll find many ways almost. to talk myself out a lot of things. Uh, what? <laughs> to elitist almost. <laughs> well, well, I mean, but okay, that's fine. I've, I've never hidden, I've never hidden that part. Like I'm, I love to gatekeep in sort in more of a passive aggressive way. It's not like really gatekeeping. Like I'm not going to keep the, the gate shut, but I'll, you know, be sassy if you're trying to, you know, if you're trying to like 1295 P12, the gate or something. Yes, exactly. Right. I got you. Um, <clears throat> okay. But so yeah, what to use. Right. I mean, you have to, you, you have to break the ice somehow, right? I think I saw somebody on Twitter and like, I think I got the same thing too. Um, of like somebody starting a game with the wrong move like somebody posted a screenshot yes of somebody i think they started e5. the game with like one e5 yeah that's i you know what i think i've gotten the same message before like years ago 
Really? Like someone yeah. initiating a game by playing pawn to e5 with you? Right. And then I also remember actually somebody saying d4. And then I think in response, I played f5. And then I think she unmatched me. Or maybe she was a bot. <laughs> I'm not sure. D4, F5. Dope. Yeah. No Dutch I was, players. I mean, to date Dutch which, players. like, really, if you think about it, that's, Fairly that's reasonable. her loss. You don't, yo, really? <laughs> that's funny. We had two different things. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, no, that's true. I mean, why wouldn't you want to go for something yeah. like that? Yeah. I mean, honestly, I was a bit afraid for the, for the response. Like, but, you know, really, I guess the testing one is maybe... D4, is, is, C5, because if they play C3, then, uh, you know, no thank you. A question, though, is D4, F5, and then if they respond with 2, G4, is that instant marriage proposal? Uh, yeah, definitely. Or, you know, yeah, I'll make sure to have my sleep with my eyes open just to make sure, like, <laughs> I'm not going to get stabbed or something. But No, I'm just kidding. But yes, that that is definitely grounds for the love is blind so TV, like a uh, syndicated TV show marriage proposal. I can just, I can kind of picture, you know, like the, you know, the, the text, uh, the screen, like the screen cap of the text where like on the left side, it's one D four on the right side. It's, you know, one dot, dot, dot F five on the left side, it's two dot G four. And then on the right side, it's just, will you marry me? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Here I got, I got a trick question for you. Okay. Um, what about D four F five B three? I, I actually am pretty unfamiliar with those. So, I mean, what's the idea? Is it just to like play against the just, just like the would it, does, it, Dutch? does it constitute an instant marriage proposal? Probably not, simply because I would want more information. Like I would Very feel good. a little. Confused. That's the right answer. Yeah, yeah. I would want to. I would want to see what's coming next. I think. I I agree. Yeah. I mean, I was going to say I had it in mind um, with like Joe Baba's idea of uh, playing like Bishop B two, Knight C three, Queen D two, and Long Castle. Which is okay. a setup he already used in one B three against many other things. Like for instance, he has a famous game. Uh, like I know there is a symmetrical game, like uh, with Geary B three B six or Ivanchuk maybe B three B six Bishop B two Bishop B seven Knight C three Knight C six D four D five Queen D two Queen D seven. <laughs> Long. It, like some course, something ridiculous. Of course, like those that. two would do something like that. But if it was connected with that idea, like. Like, you know, I'll, if, okay, so like, whatever, b3, knight f6, d4, f5, b3, knight f6, bishop b2, g6. This is where, like, I'm going to kind of be in a little bit of suspense. If they play right. e3, there's still some hope. Right. And then if their next move is knight c3, marriage proposal. Right. We got to see what, what that, what that queen's knight does, basically. Yeah. Right. Exactly. It's not like, this is how uh, this is how just players mouth, determine their right. <laughs> relationship. Plans. Definitely, no, for sure. Like, <laughs> I wish there was an app for that, but it's it's right. not like what oh, that that's mouth a great do. idea. Chess, it's ch- huh? I'm, I'm 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 ruining your joke. Oh no, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> I was just gonna say that's no, a no, great it's your idea. show. Like, go ahead. Chess tender or something, right? Oh, absolutely. I think there have been some discussions on that. Um, anyway, but yeah, okay. The joke didn't land the first time, but it was just like. You know, it's not what that mouth do. It's what that queen knight do. Like, because that, that does determine a lot of, you know, a lot of yeah. things. Where, what that where queen you, knight indeed where, do. What that queen knight indeed do and when. And yeah, that, that's true. We need to see. We need to see your move order with the queen knight and where you put it. Mm-hmm. Okay, so I think that we what we have succeeded, Gopal, we probably have not succeeded in determining what chess is most like. Although I, think I thought you were talking about my personal relationships. Gopal. That's where I was going to go with this. I think we have succeeded in figuring out your, your new Tinder profile. What that queen might do. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, all right. I, I like that. That's pretty good. Um, any final thoughts? Like, what is chess most like? We covered a lot of, a lot of ground. We talked about sports. We talked about Q sports. We talked about relationships, comedy. I, you know, I think for, from my perspective, I, I fall back on something I said earlier, which is there are a lot of aspects and elements of chess that you can very closely analogize to certain things and make perfect sense. But in terms of finding something that is a close match it's really hard to do, you know, to, to all of the, and that sort of speaks to the depth and breadth of the game of chess. Yeah. And it's, also it's the, really hard. Right. And also the, 
you know, the beauty and nuance of, of other games. Too, right. You know, yep, like I know, fair. I know we, mm-hmm. we're trying to close out this segment, but um, you know, one thing that we haven't brought up is go, which I know you love to play oh, go. Yeah. Good point. And like just hearing the commentators uh, talking about like a, a move in, in one area drastically affecting the play all the way on the other side of the board, which seems like, you know, for a chess player, that board is like three miles long yeah. and wide. Like how right. does it, how does that like little move affect, but they, but they've, they figured it out and, you know, the theory still evolving kind of like chess with the neural net engines and stuff. Um, but yeah, like, I mean, it's, it's similar to chess, like in that aspect, kind of think about our inclusion of pawn moves. Like I was talking about a six and a four, in the Benoni sometimes. Um, yeah, I would and, say like, honestly, in a lot of like very material ways, the two games are extremely similar. Right. Not just yeah. in like, not just in like, a, like how they're played and stuff, but just like in how you would approach becoming a very serious go player versus how you would approach becoming a very right. serious chess player. I would think like in terms of the actions you're taking, it's probably almost identical to be honest. Oh, for sure. Yeah, definitely. And like a lot of the, uh, like typical strategic mo- uh, motives in that uh, game, like they have lo- like some of the same vibes, you know, yeah. as yeah. we would like just fixing the pawn structure or like, yeah. Playing just, on just a flank like versus that. playing in the center, understanding right. like how space is, you know, and, and temp- tempo and space are like really crucial concepts in both games. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Timing of your moves, move order. Like, yeah, they're just, uh, that's a good point. Um, I'm glad you brought that up. I'm, I'm surprised I didn't think of it because yeah, you're right that those two are extremely similar. It's almost like they're in my mind. They're just like the same thing, you know, mm-hmm. and that's probably why I didn't even think of it. And uh, some of my, and just, sorry, one last thought on this. Like I know for like some of my pool player friends who are going to be listening to this, like I, I do want to point out, like we have talked about cer- some aspects of pool, but uh, one of the big differences is that you could play perfect and still lose in pool. You know, you could right. make like all the, the right shots, but like a lot of things are out of your control. Like when you break the balls, like, do you have a look at, at anything good? Or, you know, did your opponent like miss terribly, but get super lucky. And now you're in a very low percentage spot to come out better off than you were before, like, or than you are now. So there that's, and you could also, uh, you could also lose a game too without even having a say, like if your opponent breaks and runs on you. Like the other day I got second place in a tournament, but my first round started off with um, like battling with this very strong player, um, Song Liang, like he's, he's one of the best players in our league. And so I didn't have much good to look at the first two games. And then he broke and ran clearing the table three games in a row playing nine ball and wow. just like played awesome. But like, I didn't, you know, I, I didn't feel bad because I like, I didn't really get much of a chance to show what I was made of. And like, yeah, next match I had, like I broke and ran then like a few more times throughout that tournament as well. So like you can, that's one important thing. You could lose a game without even having a say. Which is not the case in chess, of course. Right, exactly. There's always something you could do. Yeah. Interesting. I think, uh, you know, I think this is a really unique topic and a good one to to look at because it has become, and by it I mean chess, has really become almost this omnipresent force in our in our media and in our culture yeah. where it's everywhere. And sort of really getting into it and dissecting, you know, some of these analogies I think was a, was a worthwhile exercise in my opinion. Absolutely. All right, Gopal, we have this cool idea for our show that we're going to, well, hopefully people will find it cool. I don't know. Maybe we're just uh, crazy. Uh, it's called This Month in Chess. Of course, uh, we all uh, uh, are familiar with uh, the This Week in Chess, that great uh, uh, great news. I, how would you describe The Week in Chess? Something like a... You know, thing? I'm not sure. Wait. Like, yeah, like, I I just used it for, for the PGN downloads, you know? Right, yeah. Uh, like, the only news is, oh, the tournament happened? Okay, I'm not reading any of the, the write-up, unfortunately. But, but, I mean, all I care about is really just the, the moves and, like, trying what to look happened, for some yeah. new idea. Well, yeah, new ideas in the opening, especially like right. combing through those. The month, This month in chess is a little different. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to go through some um, news items that happened during this month, April, 
in the chess world. And this is a quick hit or go, Paul. I'm going to read the headline. You're going to react. I may hop back in there and react a little bit too. Um, for April, we have six news headlines for this month in chess. We're going to do this every month to wrap up the show, kind of as a fun way to catch all our listeners up on what is going on in the chess world. And also, of course, for you and I to make ourselves giggle a few more times before we uh, mm-hmm. call it a day. Let's, uh, let's, let's hop right in. So first, this month in chess, April 2022, Magnus Carlsen, world chess champion Magnus Carlsen, finishes in the money 25th at the Norwegian Poker Championships. Uh, love React? Is oh, sorry, wait, this is, oh, no, I'm, I'm talking, this isn't Facebook. Uh, no, that, that's cool. I mean, I don't know, uh, I saw that he was competing. Um, I didn't check the tournament, but, like, uh, all, like, if I'm not mistaken with poker, there's no, like, sort of centralized ranking system uh, with those. I mean, maybe it's, like, your, your money list or whatever, but I understand with such a volatile game, it's hard to have like a steady ELO or something like that, you know? And there's different specialties too, right? Like some people of course, are like pot yeah. limit, some people like Omaha, Texas Hold'em, some people like tournaments, some like cash games. So there's like all sorts of different specialties. Which we should talk about that, why chess players are more likely to scoff at like variants, you know, or at least some of the best players in the world. But I, I think some of the variants actually have a future, you know? I like that. That's Let's, let's put that on our topic list for upcoming shows, chess variants. And yes. also like... Maybe another interesting topic. Why are chess players so darn good at poker? Seems yeah. like a lot of them are, right? Like Darn good? Uh, darn yeah, good. I mean... I'm so, <laughs> so dang good at poker. Why? Guess <laughs> Come on, man. Okay, Cletus. Um, yeah, I mean, that that's awesome. Like, uh, how, how big was the field? Uh, it was pretty large. I didn't put that in our show notes because I'm uh, super well prepared for everything. Yeah. Um, but it was a pretty large field. Like 25th was like well inside the money. Uh, he played, he, he played very well. It was like a notable finish. But... I wonder what like his opponent's attitudes were um, towards him playing poker. Like were they starstruck or were they trying to, you know, like I'm sure like I any, imagine a it would be hard not to be starstruck, be. right? Like, right. Or, you know, some people it's like, probably like, oh, how'd this fish get so far or something like that? Or, <laughs> right. or you know, if you're probably the most likely case, if you're like an experienced professional player, you're probably just trying to be very objective doing math, just doing the math. It doesn't matter who's sitting in front of you, you know, right. It's kind of robotic approach, which is probably the most sustainable, but I'm just curious how most of his opponents, like, like just what they were thinking sitting at the table with him. It would be very interesting to go back and, how and it watch affect some their of the decisions. replays. They're all Definitely. Norwegian, so like I wouldn't know a whole lot about the commentary, but right. But we just both know poker, reactions. though. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, and some of the decisions too. Okay, next one. Ding Li Ren continues his push for thirty rated classical games to qualify for the candidates. Of course, he's taking Karyakin's spot, who was disqualified uh, after being Thank banned God. by Fide. <laughs> Um, so the, the headline here is Ding Li Ren continues to push for 30 red classical games. Could this be a, like a world record for a player rated above 2,800, like total games played in a month? Probably, right? Yeah, you'd have to think so. It's hard to remember the, the last time it happened. Um, yeah, like a 2,800 classically rated player playing this many games in such a short period of time. Yeah, I'm trying to think who, like, maybe Ivanchuk, maybe when he was close... Like, I don't Ivanchuk think he ever broke def- 28, though. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's why I said, like, probably when he was close. I don't yeah. really know what his highest was, but, like, you know, he was probably one of the most active of the elite players, if I'm not mistaken. Would would a match like uh, Kasparov Karpov World Championship, would that have done it? Because I know they played a ton of games, they actually got worn out, right? And was Kasparov yeah. over 2,800 at the time? Um... This is a question no, for our chess historians. Where's no, I don't believe... No, I don't think... They, no, because I think there were the only two players 2,700. I think you're right. And the ratings yeah. didn't really start really creeping up until, like, the mid-90s. But for... Yeah, but, like, basically, for our purposes, they were. But, see, that's a match. And, like, sure, he had one match in there. And then there's, like, a round robin going on right now. Yeah, uh, right. And then, or, or, no, maybe it was two I think it's the other robin. way around. I think it was a round robin first and then a match. And now and then another, another round robin. Yes, yeah. exactly. Basically, yeah, they're it. they're doing everything they can to get him the number of games he needs to qualify. Which yeah. fair enough. I mean, he deserves to be in there, right? Right. Exactly. 
uh, not his fault. He couldn't get the the classical games in the quote unquote normal way because of COVID restrictions. Right, for sure. I mean, and like looking at the games, it's not really anything suspicious. Like some like what people are saying. Oh, I just you know? think that's silly. Yeah, right. Yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, whatever. I'll just throw this out there. I mean, one of the main kind of proponents of this uh, was a supporter of Donald Trump, and so yeah, kind of a little irrational thinker, I'll say. Uh, yeah. And, and, you know, the guy's grandmaster, so he, whatever. But, uh, but I mean, looking at the games, there, there are a few things like, okay, Dingler in obviously genius, like very dynamic uh, right. attacking player. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's really not a whole lot uh, that's new where you see a lot of games that are drawn almost without playing. Not like we make, like eight moves in a totally symmetrical exchange Slav, like bishop f4, bishop f5, and then I trade bishop d3 for your bishop, you trade bishop d6 for my right. bishop, like, or Zaitsev, Rui Lopez, knight g5, rookie eight, all, like all that stuff. But um, <clears throat> it's kind of known in, in the Chinese league that like a lot of the players are very friendly with one another and they are, uh, and they do work together a lot. So it's yeah. common for... And and they have like a forty move uh, requirement for moves. Some of the games you know? have been really good too. Like I, I've I've been following some of the action, and like they're really interesting to play back through. Right, exactly. But you're gonna see a lot of games like that. And honestly, if I were playing thirty classical games uh, in, like, I, I, in I a month, a like, quick draws here and there. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. Or, or not even quick draws. Like the game goes to move thirty six, but nothing ever happens. Really, right. You know. Right. So it's like it's it's very. Kind of static, Placid, yeah. placidly beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> I would right, say next. It's, it's beautiful, but yeah, okay. <laughs> placidly placid. Placidly Definitely. placid. Um, okay. Uh, next headline Popular streamer, streamer uh, Lula Robs, makes harassment claims at the Reykjavik Open. Yeah, I mean, that, that was really sad to hear. Um, you know, I've talked to Lula a lot, like way before any of this happened. Uh, Lula's a great person, very enthusiastic and, uh, you know, great student of the game. And then just, uh, honestly, I have to say, I'm not surprised. Uh, you know, as, as we know, like chess, very heavily male dominated game. And so kind of hard for like femme femmes or femme presenting people to feel welcome in that environment in the first place. And then, uh, on top of all that, the, some of the responses that Lula got were terrible. Um, yeah. Like my Twitter account was like temporarily restricted because I replied to somebody who commented on one of her other posts, like, Hey, were you wearing this when you got harassed? And I, and I tagged him and I was like, Hey, I know some bridges you can go jump off of real quick. Oh no. And then, yeah. So yeah, my Twitter account got restricted, yeah. but his, but his comments still there, you know? Uh, you know, I mean, Chess has uh, a lot of tradition and a lot of rich traditions, but we also have some bad ones. And I, I think yeah. this, this like, you know, uh, the, these sort of attitudes represent some of the worst traditions of chess and it's time to move on. I mean, we're in like the 21st century. Let's go guys. Come on. Get yeah. the program. Yeah, really. You know, uh, Lula's a great person. Really. Uh, yeah. We really feel for her. And um, yeah, that's just, that's just terrible. Like, and and it's funny, like, when you brought that up, I was thinking about just a slightly older case that happened. Um, so you so you used to play on ICC. Like, you're familiar with the infamous uh, Olegas, right? Uh, I am, yes. Yeah, so, like, plays in, like, the driest possible way. But, like, the guy, like, you know, he'll play King Rook versus King Rook if you both have, like, a minute on the clock. You know, the guy's, like, so boring. Um but so I think it was Anna Rudolph. She played well in, in some tournament and was got some accusations from a GM and then Oleg Krivonosov, but like only because she played well. And it wasn't even like any really overwhelming evidence. Like I saw the games and, wow. you know, yeah. it was just them screwing up. But it's just like, yeah, like you said, it's the 21st century. Like we really need to, if we're trying yeah. to really expand the Move game, we need it. to. Let's go. And, and yeah, and move, yeah, make the game more welcoming. Right. Yeah, especially. And, and for, listen. Right, especially just like in an in person environment. You know, there's just no place for that. 
Absolutely. Uh, there's no place for it anywhere, but you know, people, people need to feel safe. Um, sticking with the Reykjavik Open, 16-year-old Grandmaster Ramesh Babu Pragnandana wins the Reykjavik Open this year. How did I do on that name pronunciation? Uh, Ramesh Babu? Okay. I, I felt like I got kind of close. Sounds Ramesh like your safe word. Uh, <laughs> what? Yeah, so he wins this year. Uh, young um, Indian talent, Phenom, beat Carlson in a rapid game online. Everybody made a big deal about it. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about his victory? And see the next 2700? Uh, I mean, yeah, he's, uh, you know, uh, here's the thing. Like, I think Chess News always likes to talk about the flavor of the month. And there, there are a lot of players who, you know, may not have lived up to, to that or, or whatever. And, and, and it's not really a bad thing. That's just how the, the game is. The game is so tough and brutal now. And right. also, too, your, your worth and like whether or not you're an interesting player or whatever is not determined by that. But uh, I mean, sure he could be, but you know, we've, you and me, we've been around this game for a while. So we've seen a lot of players uh, kind of be in that spotlight and, you know, not make it to 2,700, which, you know, it's not it's, like it's I a said, high standard. Yeah, it really is. for sure. I mean, look, if you're, if you're 2,600, I mean, you, you play, you You've play awesome. Yeah, exactly. Right. Like you, you understand chess on a, on a very high level. Like really it's just like, I was talking to Grandmaster Elshan Mora Diabati about this a long time ago. Like I believe he made 2,600 mm -hmm. and uh, you know, he, he talks about like, well, me playing a 2,700 player, it, it's not like very, it's very rare that I'll get totally blown out, you know, cause he, he is a very solid player with a great positional understanding and opening repertoire. But uh, he's like, you know, it's just usually like a critical moment. Like if I just blink for a second, you know, yeah. Uh, but usually the game is always pretty even and neck to neck to neck. Um, speaking of even and neck to neck, there's a really interesting field. The next topic here, the inaugural American cup starts actually today. I believe right now it's underway. It, yeah. It's going in on. St. Louis. Right yeah. How do you feel about this? Uh, premier event on American soil. Another one we should say. Uh, yeah, it's, it's great. You know, um, I mean, I think, well, actually, okay. I, I, it, it's great. And it, I don't, I don't really know if it's that great at the same time. Like, I mean, like, I don't know how much it really does to promote chess. Like as much as people say it's good for chess or the image of chess, like, you know, the interviews are kind of dull like, it's just, I mean, I wouldn't say it's, it's totally the same people or whatever, but um, to me, I think the most exciting things that are happening in chess are these big open tournaments where you have to kind of, where like the, the strongest players in the world have to expose themselves they have to. to yeah. yeah, exactly. And so like, you know, that's why I thought millionaire chess was a great idea. I mean, I, I was dumb. I didn't get to play in any of the editions um, of millionaire chess, but it, you know, conceptually it, yeah oh for sure like i think that's that's probably i think what chess needs to rejuvenate itself a little bit in america just some sort of fide grand swiss style thing but something more sustainable or even um like like pool like pool players have have usually had a tour historically you know for many years they were lacking a tour um but like some sort of right. tour, kind of like the, the USCF Grand Prix tour, but more like just tour oriented, you know, like right. this is the next big tournament, like next big and, stop on the tour, if you will. Right. Exactly. That's an interesting take. I, I, I think you're right. I think these, like the FIDE Grand Swiss was really fun to watch. Um, I would say why not both, right? Like it's nice to have high level chess in the United States again. Um, I feel like there was a, a dearth of it for quite a long time. So it's cool that it's back and like they're doing stuff like this. But yeah, I agree with you. Like, let's let's have a FIDE Grand Swiss. Let's have a uh, like a, um, a master tour or something, right? Almost like the the golf tour or whatever the right pro, pro circuit. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I just feel like you know, I can only hear people say like, oh, oh, this is great for chess in America, like all this stuff. But like, but how? You know, I don't. And there really are other see. there are other things too, right? There are other gaps that could be filled and that are that. Uh, where we could put 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 an event in that place, right? Yeah, definitely. I mean, you and me, we've had uh, like I, I remember we had a very memorable tournament last time we were at uh, we were playing in St. Louis, which was a while ago. 
Um, yeah, that was fun. It was a yeah. great time. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I don't think the the chess club is like that big to host such a, a tournament, but like, you know, just if if that's going to be the the center of chess, like, why does it feel like the Mid America Open is like the the best open tournament around there? You know what I mean? At least held on a yearly basis. Yeah, that's fair. Speaking of large tournaments and tours, though, our last our last point here <laughs> uh-huh. plays right into that. Uh, Champions Chess Tour hosts the Oslo Esports Cup. This is the first in-person event of the tour. You might remember this is the tour that um, they have uh, a great commentary for uh, a lot of the matches. Um, a lot of them have been online. And, you know, what, one thing you were just talking about, you know, involving like more people uh, I think this tour has done a pretty decent job of reaching out and involving like new talents. Like we saw uh, recently, uh, the Charity Cup, there was Hans Niemann, there was Lei Tingji, and players like that. Uh, so how do you feel about the Champions Chess Tour? Yeah, I mean, I think I think that's, that's really cool. Like, um, you know, I, I'll say, like, it, at least in my experience, like, the one of the ways I cut my teeth, like with regards to blitz, like I was, I was looking the other day at my highest, I was probably like 17 in the U S mm-hmm. uh, with like some 2,500 uh, blitz rating, uh, like probably 2,550 or something. But um, you know, it wasn't really taken that seriously uh, for a while. And like with COVID though, that was all we had. For right. a while, and These so online rapid events and blitz events, yeah, right. And so it started to be taken just a lot more seriously, which which was nice. Um, but yeah, like like I mean, that's that's certainly how I developed. And there's definitely like I think a right and, or and wrong way to do it. Although even you could do so called wrong way, but it just depends on you know your personality or, or whatever. But um, but yeah, like it, it's it's nice to see that. Uh, kind of being taken seriously now. Yeah, I completely agree. I love I love the rapid format. It's like bang bang action. You know, it's a lot more entertaining to me yeah. to watch these games. And like, <clears throat> honestly, the games tend to be more fighting and exciting as well because of the shorter time format. So yeah, I'm absolutely. I think that's a great way to you know rejuvenate uh, elite chess for sure. Like I've always thought more blitz and rapids, especially like open ones too. Yeah. Uh, are definitely the way because this is the way. It's, yeah, for sure. I mean, you could try to to play like a lot, like very conservative style in in such tournaments, but uh, definitely the rapid and blitz style lends itself to letting you know, just sort of letting loose a little bit. Right. Um, okay, that's it. Go, Paul. We're done. That was this month in chess. That was April twenty twenty two. Any parting shots for our main theme or in general? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I think, uh, let's see. I mean, as, let's see. For pool, shout out to Larry Schwartz. Uh, great player, great uh, teacher. I've learned a lot from his teaching style uh, in pool, and I've translated that to chess. Uh, shout out to Lula Robs. I mean, it really sucks, uh, you know, what's happening right now, but you have a lot of people that support you. And so we want to try to work with you and help make things better. Um, yeah. Shout out to Pete also for, (laughs) for finally, uh, you know, getting me on here. We've been wanting to do this for a while. Yeah. And I think we've got some, some really fun topics coming up ahead and I look forward to doing this again next month guys go paul has agreed to to be back and we'll talk tackle some more interesting chess questions in the month ahead um in the meantime for national master go paul menon i am your host pete garianis this is the chess underground um thank you and good night safety reasonable daddy out thank you for listening to the chess underground a u.s chess podcast Please check out our entire suite of podcasts, which release every Tuesday, and include Ladies' Night with Jen Shahad, as well as Chess Life cover stories and One Move at a Time with Dan Lucas. U.S. Chess would like to thank Jason Andre at Seven Season Films Photography and Media for a podcast production and editing. If you are starting your own podcast, visit www.sevenseasonfilms.com for consulting, production, and editing. Until next time, signing off, Pete Karyanis.